While camping with her family in Montana, a seven-year-old girl was abducted from her tent. No one in the campground witnessed the crime, and the kidnapper left no clues. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. At the time, little was known of criminal profiling. Agents would use it as they raced against the clock to find a criminal more monstrous than anyone imagined. Southwestern Montana, a land of epic mountain ranges and vast prairies. In June 1973, the Yeager family came to Montana from Michigan. Marietta Yeager was excited about her family exploring the West. Bill Yeager, a longtime auto worker, had taken a month off for this once in a lifetime trip. It was seven year old Susie's first family vacation. Marietta's parents had also joined them for the trip. On Sunday, June 24th, they prepared to spend the last night in Montana's Headwaters State Park. In the morning, they would continue west. The eldest boy slept in the van, while the four young ones had their own tent. Check yourselves in good, guys. Like every night, Susie wouldn't go to sleep without a good night hug and kiss. Sleep fast. Night night. The night was chilly. Still, the Jaeger children slept peacefully. The adults slept in a camper truck a few feet away. But not everyone in the campground was asleep. awoke 13-year-old Heidi Yeager. She noticed a hole in the tent. Then she noticed Susie wasn't there. Confused and scared, she rushed to tell her parents. Wake up, wake up. Marietta Yeager tried to understand what her daughter was saying. I just thought that she must be just somewhere around. She's around, she's, she had to go to the bathroom, she, you know. Um, but at the same time, there's this terror rising in you that, you know, oh, please God, don't let this be true. Don't let this be true. I mean, I can remember wanting to wake up and find out that this is not real. This is not really happening. Then they saw the hole sliced in the tent. That's when it's like, like it or not, Marietta, this is, this is reality. And more than she's gone, but someone has taken her. Their hearts sank further when they spotted Susie's stuffed animals in the grass. She was sleeping with them. She always slept with them. And she used to drop them because she couldn't hold on to them. It made it clear to me that she was taken away by force. Right away, Bill Yeager drove to a phone to call police. All right, all right, let's go, let's go. Okay, Mr. Yeager, slow down. I need you to tell me what's going on. 
I want you to hold on the line. I'm going to get help. The sheriff's dispatcher immediately radioed Gallatin County Deputy Don Houghton, who was working the night shift. State Park Campground. Have report of a seven-year-old. Ten-four. I'm away. On the way to the headwaters, Deputy Houghton stopped to pick up City County Investigator John Onstead. Violent crime was rare in the area, so at first, Investigator Onstead thought it a false alarm. We're thinking that it really must be something else, that uh, something like this would, would, uh, uh, would not be a kidnapping and it would resolve itself somehow. When the investigators arrived, the Jaeger family was distraught. As the Jaegers explained what they could, they brought the investigators to the back of the campsite. That changed everything for Deputy Houghton. And that's when we saw the tent and that the tent had been slit and uh, that kind of picked things up a little bit. It was a little eerie. Footprints from the family were scattered around the tent in the damp grass. But investigator Onstead could see one set with a clear direction. I could see the tracks in the dew coming to and, and from the area where the tent was, going back to a parking area, and the parking area had no vehicles in it. The Gallatin County Sheriff's Office contacted the FBI. 1022, Special Agent Pete Dunbar took the call at the Bozeman Field Office. Special Agent Dunbar. The FBI often joins kidnapping investigations because of the possibility of interstate travel. Got a call on the In any abduction, time is critical, as the chance of finding a victim alive diminishes with each passing hour. What is it? I'll tell you on the way. Dunbar and Special Agent William Terry left for the campground immediately. By the time the agents arrived, local deputies had started to search for Susie and had begun interviewing the other campers. <laughs> The only clues so far were the footprints and the gash in the tent. But that was enough to convince Special Agent Dunbar what happened. No question there was a kidnapping. In some cases you don't know, some types it's a parental type of thing, but in this instance, absolutely no question but there was a kidnapping of a child. The search quickly became one of the largest in Montana history. We had helicopters, we used the National Guard uh, flying, we had uh, boats, we had all terrain vehicles, we had riders out identifying areas of abandoned buildings, old mine sites, anywhere where a person might be located. They began at the Jaeger campsite then expanded in widening circles. During the search, a few veteran deputies recalled a similar investigation in the same campground five years earlier. That crime was discovered May 5th, 1968, when during a troop outing, a boy scout tried to wake up his tent mate. The 12-year-old had been stabbed and beaten during the night. The scout's lung had been punctured, and he suffered severe head trauma. He died the following day. That case remained unsolved. Many of those searching for Susie couldn't help but wonder if that killer was back. Police and the FBI sought the public's help. Hundreds of alarmed citizens throughout Montana called in tips. Deputies followed up on each one. One caller urged authorities to interview his 25-year-old neighbor in Manhattan, Montana, describing him as odd. The deputies knew the man, a local contractor. Nothing appeared suspicious, however. 
And like others in the community, he said he would do what he could to help. Then, a week after Susie disappeared, a man telephoned the home of a Gallatin County, Montana deputy. Who is this? The deputy's wife answered. Just a minute, let me call the caller claimed to be Susie's kidnapper and demanded a $50,000 ransom be delivered to a bus station in Denver. To confirm he had Susie, he described a minor deformity, rounded, hump-like nails on the young girl's index fingers. Okay. The woman called her husband, who contacted the FBI at the command center set up at the campground. Special Agent Dunbar told the Jaegers about the ransom call. When he mentioned the fingernails, they were stunned. Susie did have rounded nails on her index fingers. The call was legitimate. Agents needed the kidnapper to call back with details about the ransom drop. But the call never came. A crushing blow for the family and investigators, according to FBI Special Agent William Terry. As time went by and there was nothing to uh, give directions as to where the money should be placed or uh, how she was going to be returned, uh, the hope uh, left. Watching deputies drag the rivers in Headwaters Park for a body was agonizing for the Jaegers. Yet Marietta and Bill refused to give up hope. I made a commitment to um, stay faithful to her as, my, as her mother, that not to give up, to continue to believe that she was still alive until such time, if ever it would have to happen, that I would have to accept concrete proof to the contrary. Still, the Jaegers could not remain in the campground forever. Bill needed to return to work. So after more than a month, the family had to go home. And it was so hard to leave, you know, for me to leave the last place that I had seen her. Despite the best efforts of law enforcement, they had not been able to find the kidnapper. But soon, he would find Marietta. In June 1973, seven-year-old Susie Yeager was abducted from her tent in Headwaters State Park, Montana. Although the family had to return to Michigan, the FBI assured Susie's parents, Bill and Marietta Yeager, that they would not give up on the case. Now, as soon as we got to Detroit, the FBI agents were there were waiting for us. And uh, so I felt... I felt um, I could trust them. I felt that they were competent and they were willing to keep me informed. And for me, that was very important. I needed to know everything that was going on. Though investigators thought Susie had likely been murdered, the Jaegers still hoped she was alive and that the kidnapper would make contact again. The FBI arranged for the phone company to trace any calls from the kidnapper and asked the Jaegers to place a recording device on their telephone. I think the kids and I should be able to handle that. It doesn't seem too technical. The family and their friends worked diligently to make certain nobody forgot about Susie. They established the Susie Jaeger Reward Fund and printed 10,000 posters, which they mailed to every sheriff's office in Montana and the surrounding states, asking for them to be posted locally. Months passed. Still, the family continued to hope the kidnapper would call. It just sort of became my task to be there on the phone. And um, only one time did I leave in the beginning and that was to pick up a son, uh, one of my kids, at a class from which he was supposed to have gotten a ride home, and it, but that did show. And so I was out of the house 10 minutes, and the kidnapper called.
following established routine, the eldest son, Dan, who remained in the house, snapped on the yeah, tape recorder. Who, who is this? Would you like to know our Susie? Dan asked the kidnapper to release his sister. The caller complained that the police and FBI were involved. He said he couldn't release Susie without getting caught. Seconds later, Marietta came home. Danny had just hung up the phone, and I could just tell by the look on his face. It was just stricken. He didn't even have to tell me. I knew he had just spoken to the kidnapper. And we had that call on tape, but no way of knowing who it was. Authorities traced the call to a diner in Wyoming. Local officers checked the place, but the caller was gone. And employees did not recall anyone who had been on the payphone. FBI Special Agent William Terry there was a consensus of opinion at that time that Susie was uh, dead. Yeah. And for some reason, uh, this individual was uh, attempting to torment the Yeager family. Months passed with no new leads or calls. Eight months after Susie's kidnapping, the Gallatin County Sheriff's Office received a report that a 19-year-old woman had disappeared from Manhattan, Montana, 10 miles from the campground where Susie vanished. Her mother was worried and told the deputies what she knew. Mommy, daughter? Oh, yeah. she I had fun. You drive safe, right? She said that her daughter, Sandra Smolligan, was last seen on February 9th, returning to her apartment around midnight after a night out with friends. Her mother said Sandra's car was gone, and no one had heard from her in days. Like almost everyone in the small town, the deputies knew Sandra. They opened a missing persons case and set out in search of her car. Gallatin County Deputy Don Houghton, still working the Susie Yeager kidnapping, was also part of the new investigation. The area that I was assigned was to the northwest of the town of Manhattan. And this was a large area. And what we were doing was driving county roads, dirt roads, farm roads, looking for the car. On an abandoned ranch in the Horseshoe Hills, Deputy Houghton noticed fresh tire tracks off a dirt road, then spotted something that seemed out of place. Got out uh, to see what it was, and, and it happened to be a pair of women's panties. Houghton wanted to check out the barn nearby. The door was nailed shut. Inside, a tarp and other debris covered a car. The license plate had been removed. But in the small community, most people knew their neighbors' vehicles. Deputy Houghton recognized the car. It was Sandra Smolligan's. There was no trace of the young woman. I need a 1013 on a white Ford. Houghton called in the find. WP 521. Deputies, sheriff's posse members, and volunteers scoured five square miles surrounding the barn. In line searches, they marked any items that might be evidence. Two days into the search, 
One group investigated a 55-gallon drum they found in a field. There's something right here. Can you get a couple pictures? Something had been burned inside. Step back, please. Step back. Among charred wood were bone fragments. And the more we looked, we found bones spread out probably over a 75-yard area, uh, most in very small pieces. Uh, they'd been broken up, chopped up, they were burned. In the end, they collected more than 1,200 bone fragments. A forensic pathologist determined they were human, and some were probably from an adult white female. Dental records confirmed several teeth and jawbone fragments belonged to Sandra Smolligan. Investigator John Onstad feared that Sandra's killer might have also kidnapped Susie Yeager. There was beginning to be a, a connection, um, probably partly due to the uh, to the uh, part of the country we live in and and what uh, what goes on here, what doesn't go on here. Sandra Smolligan had been dismembered. Whoever committed such an unspeakable crime might have taken Susie, too. Hey, deputy. Eight deputy. months after Susie Yeager vanished from a Montana campground, deputies discovered the remains of Sandra Smolligan at a nearby Horseshoe Hills ranch. Authorities feared a connection. It's gone. There you go. In there. Gone. The investigators working the two cases frequently ate lunch together. One resident often joined them, always asking about the cases. David Masterson was an ex-Marine and a well-known local contractor. Some townspeople considered him strange. In the first week of the investigation, Masterson had been questioned about Susie's disappearance. Deputy Don Houghton knew that people who are overly curious about a crime are often involved. On numerous occasions, David would come in and, and uh, sit with us and eat. Uh, always inquisitive. Uh, we were always cautious of what we said around him. Uh, but he was always volunteering, uh, volunteering for a search. Uh, just kept in front of us, I guess. He just it bugged us. FBI Special Agent Pete Dunbar realized Masterson was familiar with the area where Sandra's body was found. David surfaced as a suspect again because we knew enough about David from before to know that he knew the Horseshoe Hills very well. And also, it developed that he had dated this girl, Sandra Smolligan. Investigators asked Masterson to take a polygraph examination. He agreed. I had a great deal of faith in a polygraph. I had had it utilized on other cases before and invariably uh, was a tremendous tool and never had one where it backfired. During the examination, Masterson denied knowing anything about Susie Yeager's kidnapping or Sandra Smolligan's murder. He confirmed he dated Sandra only once because she didn't want to go out with him again. The polygraph examiner detected no sign of deception. As they had with other suspects in the Susie Yeager case, Agents asked him to submit to questioning under sodium amytal. You know Susie Yeager? I do. I mean, I've heard about her. But... At the psychiatric hospital, under the barbiturates influence, Masterson calmly answered every question. He said everything then that he told me in my interview before we did sodium amytal. He didn't deviate one iota. Uh, as far as my interview is concerned, there was no difference whether he had it or did not have it. put the investigation back to where we had nothing. We just ran out of everything. Couldn't have been more discouraged. We didn't know where to go. We had run out of suspects.
In the spring of 1974, the stalled case gathered new momentum after Dunbar met Special Agent Patrick Mullaney, who worked in the emerging field of criminal profiling. Believing he could help, Mullaney asked for the files in the Jaeger case. Give us all the interviews you've conducted. Give us all of the results of the investigations you've conducted. And we sat down for days going over all of those interviews, especially uh, what kind of investigation that they were conducting. And we came back with uh, an idea. To the profilers, the nature of the crime, including surveillance and a stealthy abduction, suggested the kidnapper had military training. He must have had the physical strength to carry and keep quiet a 55-pound girl who might be struggling. The profilers believe the perpetrator was a loner, possibly a schizophrenic, who has trouble with the opposite sex. One suspect jumped out again, David Masterson. When we came up with David Masterson as our most likely suspect, we met a whole lot of opposition from the local police department, as well as the FBI agent. And the reason for the opposition was very reasonable. Uh, it was simply that he had been a suspect early on, and they, they had asked of him to take certain truth tests. And David had passed both of them. But a schizophrenic can disassociate from reality to such a degree he might be able to lie without exhibiting any stress, thus beating the tests. The profilers also made a prediction that the kidnapper would telephone Marietta Yeager on the anniversary of the abduction. We felt that this was such an intimate killer, you know, that he had become personally involved in the killing and in the victim and the victim's life and in the victim's family's life, that he would much celebrate this event like a normal person would celebrate an anniversary. To flush the kidnapper out, Marietta Yeager granted an interview to an Associated Press reporter. She said her religious faith allowed her to feel sorry for the kidnapper and that she would like to talk to him to find out why he did it. On the night of June 24th, 1974, one year after Susie vanished, Marietta went to bed knowing that although she needed it, she would not rest. Exactly one year after Susie Yeager vanished from a Montana campground, a man telephoned Susie's mother, Marietta. Hello? The first thing he said was, is this Susie's yes. mom? And I mean, I just, then I knew for certain who it was. He said, this is the man who took her from you uh, one year ago to the minute. Can we have her back? And then the phone went dead. What happened? It was him. The Jaegers were devastated. Oh, no. What did he say? The call was so short, a successful oh, trace was unlikely. It was him. Another call, if it should come, would be the only link to their little girl. Hello? I was so relieved. I, I, I was so relieved. But my mind was spinning, you know, um, what's going to happen? What can I say? And uh, so in the beginning, I sort of gave the lead to him in the conversation. He had this need to let me know that he was the one who was in control. I have Susie. She's doing great. The kidnapper boasted he was too smart to get caught. Why did you? I don't want you to worry about it. We've, he said I, I he and Susie had been traveling together. We've been going all over the place, having a great time. People think we're family. Where is she right now? Marietta wanted proof that her daughter was alive. Ma'am, she wanted to talk to Susie. Fine. You don't need to worry. Like I said, the kidnapper said home. the girl was nearby, sleeping in his cabin. She's never, she hasn't had a By this time, I knew that my husband had notified the FBI. They were trying to trace the call, so I knew it was important to keep him on the phone. I wanted the FBI to get to him before he got away and find out, you know, if I was going to get my little girl back again. And I will do whatever it takes. As she talked, 
Marietta Yeager began to take control of the conversation. She said she had been praying for him. Don't pray for me at all. She said she felt sorry for him. Is she really still alive? Her strength and compassion wore the caller down, according to FBI profiler Patrick Mullaney. To be able to contain herself over an hour with the person that she viewed as having her child was beyond belief. The caller initially starting with the typical psychopathic challenge, I am the one that kidnapped your child one year ago to the minute this day. To turn him from that point where he's really sticking it to her to where at the end of the hour that caller could not hang up the phone and when he ultimately did hang up the phone he was sobbing crying I just came up with anything I could. agents responded to the Jaeger home hoping the call would finally lead them to the kidnapper at the time Long-distance calls passed through a series of relay stations. You gotta keep me Telephone personnel traced the call as far as Sarasota, Florida. But a system failure there prevented further tracing. Agents had to tell the Jaegers it didn't work. Seems to be a problem with trace. Um, no, let me know. All I could think of was that he had said Susie was asleep in his cabin and we'd lost the chance to find her. Then, a month later, a rancher in Montana showed investigators where somebody tapped into his telephone line. His phone bill showed a call to the Jaegers in Michigan that he hadn't made. This area here? Under the lines, he had noticed fresh tire tracks that did not match his truck tires. When asked for names of people who knew the ranch well, the rancher said, David Masterson used to work for him. The investigators recalled Masterson had been a communication specialist in the Marines and would know how to tap the lines. Agents looked into a new technology, voice print analysis. A person's voice is made unique by their body's physical makeup and scientists had begun charting voice patterns using a sound spectrograph. The voice print experts compared the anniversary call recording to a recording of an interview with Masterson. They reported a match. Investigators confronted Masterson with the voice print analysis. They explained the results indicated he had very likely made the anniversary call to the Jaegers. Masterson told Special Agent Pete Dunbar he was unimpressed. And he said, oh shoot, you know, I've got relatives whose voices sound just exactly like mine. So we asked who they were. To begin with, I want Investigators to... put together a voice lineup consisting of Masterson and the relatives he named. Ready? From the ranch where the anniversary call was made, they telephoned the Jaegers. Yes, it's Marietta. Hi, Pete. Yeah, we're ready. Each speaker identified himself by a number and read an excerpt of the anniversary call. I'm number one. Is this Susie's mom? We went to Lakeside Park in the Southern California Zoo. I'm number two. Is this Susie's mom? We went to Lakeside Park in the Southern California Zoo. As soon as I heard the second one, I knew that that was the voice that I had heard. We you know, that was indelibly etched in my memory. I would not forget that voice. It was more circumstantial evidence, but still nothing concrete. Yes. Hello, Mrs. Yeager. Investigators my... wanted a confession. <clears throat> yes. Uh, we came up with the notion that the only thing that would bring him off target and motivate him to do something that might betray himself ultimately was to put him into a direct 
confrontation with Marietta Yeager. We requested Marietta Yeager fly all the way back out into the Bozeman area, an area which had nothing but dark memories. Marietta had always believed that she and Susie's kidnapper would meet. I felt this must be the opportunity, so I was very grateful for the opportunity to come out and say to him face to face and not just to a voice on the phone that I had forgiven him. She's an extremely strong person, very uh, different from any uh, victim's mother that I know. And her forgiveness, uh, well, frankly, I think is very much different, I, very much different. I know she feels strong about it, and uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with her. On the morning of September 12, 1974, Marietta Yeager and David Masterson met at his attorney's office. Something in the depth of me knew that this was, um, this was the man. And when I looked into his face, um, I could tell by his eyes that he was a mentally ill man. Unwavering, Marietta told him she knew he had taken Susie. Masterson insisted he was innocent. They spoke for more than an hour, Marietta trying to get him to admit what he had done, but he never cracked. Finally, the attorney said, well, you know, I think this is enough. We've given it a fair shot. And um, so we stood up, and he shook hands with me. But it took all the discipline I had to let go. I mean, I just, he was the one. I knew he was the one, and I didn't want him out of my sight. We'll be right back, Ms. Sherry. I'm sorry, I'll be right back. To keep the pressure on Masterson, Gallatin County deputies put him under 24-hour surveillance. They made no effort to hide the fact that they were watching. The surveillance seemed to amuse him. But on September 24th, the suspect slipped away, according to Deputy Don Houghton. The team of officers that watched him go into his house, but he didn't come out the following morning. It got to the point that we actually went and knocked on the door, somebody did, and nobody home. We started looking everywhere we knew uh, David frequented, went to his job sites, and there was no David. While authorities were searching for Masterson, a man called the Jaegers. It was exactly one year after the kidnapper had called the first time when Marietta was out. Ma'am? The caller identified himself as Mr. Travis. Stop playing games with us, David. But as soon as he got on the phone, I knew it was his voice. What he was trying to convince me and the FBI that the real kidnapper was somebody in Salt Lake City, Utah, and not this person, David, who's being considered as a prime suspect here in Montana. He said he could prove that Susie was alive by putting her on the telephone. Your daughter's okay? Well, then listen to this. He's a nice man, Mommy. We're having fun together. Well, I knew it wasn't Susie's voice. Susie never called me Mommy. She always called me Mama. Then my fear was that he'd bribed a child to speak those words and that in his sick mind this child would become Susie and that he would harm this child too. When Marietta kept calling him David, he began to unravel. He blurted out information Marietta discussed with Masterson in Montana. Yeah. Things only David would know. I can prove that I have her. And so he totally incriminated himself. And when he realized what he did, he said, you'll never see your little girl alive again. And he slammed down the phone. Marietta called the FBI. 
and authorities traced the call to a Salt Lake City motel room, more than 400 miles from Masterson's home. But by the time they arrived, he was gone. After David Masterson eluded surveillance, investigators believed he called Marietta Yeager. Marietta heard a young girl's voice, but she knew it wasn't Susie. And only our daughter's voice. Gallatin County prosecutor Thomas Olson, who had been hoping for more evidence before an arrest, feared Masterson was more dangerous than ever. I was in a state of panic. I immediately assumed he had taken another child. And we knew he had to act. We couldn't wait any longer. When Masterson came back into town, they decided to make the arrest and hoped to find more evidence against him later. He offered no resistance. He had already hired one of the area's top attorneys. Among his personal effects, they discovered stationery from the Salt Lake City Motel where the latest call originated, with the name Travis written on it. Authorities executed a search warrant created with the help of FBI profilers, according to Deputy Don Houghton. They told us that the uh, suspect in this kind of a crime or these kind of crimes would uh, probably keep souvenirs or trophies of his victims uh, to include everything from jewelry, clothing to body parts. Yeah. Search warrant listed all those items Inside the freezer, deputies made a grisly discovery. Packages wrapped in butcher's paper, marked with the initials of the murdered woman, Sandra Marie Smolligan. Then, they found a human hand with two severed fingers clutched in its palm. They discussed the evidence with Masterson's attorney, who announced his client had a shocking confession. The attorney says David's going to admit to four murders, and that hit me like a sledgehammer. Masterson told them about the four killings. They began in 1967. He was a high school senior when he committed the first one. A fellow student had picked a fight with him. One day, he spotted the student's brother fishing with a friend. He killed the student's brother for revenge. Help! Why the boys go? Masterson said his second murder was when he killed the Boy Scout at the Headwaters campground in 1968. Kick me out. He did it to embarrass the local troop that had terminated his participation with the scouts. His third victim was Susie Yeager. He waited until he thought everyone was asleep. He said he took Susie to the Horseshoe Hills Ranch where they had found Sandra Smolligan's bones. He strangled her, dismembered her body, and scattered her remains. Anything special stand out? Just somebody else? Everyone wanted to know why. Like Masterson had no answer. Just upset. He also confessed to killing Sandra Smolligan. After she refused to see him again, he broke into her apartment. I want you to keep your mouth shut. Listen, listen to me. Keep your mouth shut. Don't move. You'll be all right. His plan was to abduct her. But when he right. covered her mouth with duct tape, he inadvertently don't covered move. her nose, too. If you don't move, it'll all be over here. As he packed her clothes, Sandra Smolligan suffocated. Sandra. 
At the same ranch, he dismembered her body, then incinerated the remains over a fire of cedar shingles and spread her bones among Susie's. It was late. I mean, I think it was like 3 a.m. And my lasting vision of David was that as he confessed to four murders, he seemed to shrink smaller and smaller in, in stature and size. And so at the end, he was a shell of a person. Thanks, John. Deputies returned him to jail, but he never made it to trial. Although prosecutors told them they would not seek the death penalty, David Masterson hanged himself with a towel hours after he confessed.